The following podcast may be disturbing to those who support hatred, terrorism, anti-Semitism, and discrimination. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome back to How We Fought Against. And uh, we have a special guest uh, today with us. Uh, a dear colleague and friend, Adam Levick from Camera. He's the co-editor of Camera UK. And uh, Adam, I think you're going to do a better job than I than I would uh, explaining uh, what Camera does, which I think is very important. You've been around for many years and I think uh, have achieved a lot. So why don't you give us a short introduction into uh, Camera and, and, and the work of the organization? Sure. Camera was founded in 1982. And our mission uh, since then has been the same. That is to fight media bias against Israel, um, to promote accurate reporting about Israel in uh, the media, and really not just the media, but anywhere where distorted um, characterizations of Israel could occur, encyclopedias, um, you know, Wikipedia, pretty much anywhere where there's distorted coverage of Israel, uh, we proactively try to promote those outlets or organizations to uh, correct um, false claims. We have a, you know, a very unique model in that we don't just blog or tweet or post on Facebook about um, inaccurate coverage of Israel, um, but we go directly to the editors, directly to the journalists, and we proactively try to get them to abide by their own editorial standards and report accurately. And where there's an error that it should be corrected and that correction should be pointed out. So since 1982, you know, the organization has grown and we now cover, um, we cover the media in four different languages, in English, Spanish, Arabic, and Hebrew. Um, and we have about 40 some odd employees, mostly based in the US, but also there's eight employees here in the Israeli office. Um, and we scour the media every day and we um, look for not just uh, factual errors, but distortions, um, important omissions. Uh, and also one of our missions is also in addition to um, distortions or errors, we also look for anti-Semitism, which is a very, um, you know, you can't really cover media bias against Israel accurately um, or thoroughly rather, unless you understand and fight back against uh, the media's failure to cover anti-Semitism within the Palestinian society, within the anti-Israel activist community. Um, it's simply impossible to, to cover the region without acknowledging um, the role anti-Semitism plays in the conflict and the role anti-Semitism plays within uh, pro-Palestinian advocacy groups. So um, our mission is pretty simple, but you know, I think we just want to, I want to be clear that one of the things we look for each day are anti-Semitic tropes, um, omissions of anti-Semitism, and that's a huge part of what we do. Um, so, and the one other thing we do other than media bias is we have a campus division, a uh, growing campus division where we try, our, our goal is to um, educate pro-Israel students, Jewish students and others on how to fight back against the, you know, the tsunami of anti-Israel activism on college campuses. Um, so um, that mission, you know, definitely corresponds to our normal media mission. It's a little different, but when it comes to, at the end of the day, what we do is promote accuracy and give our uh, supporters all over the world and, and on campus and just out there in general, the tools necessary to combat media bias and we empower them with the facts and the information necessary to file their own complaints and to proactively fight media bias. Uh, media bias is a constant problem and um, you know we've, we've scored a lot of victories and I'm happy to talk to you about that today, but um, it's something that sadly I don't think is ever gonna go away. Oh yeah, I, uh, well, I hope you're wrong, but I feel like you're right. Um, so I have a few questions that I'm curious about. So first question, um, is there any other organization in the world that, that uh, is, is um, dealing with any other country or society or minority that does what you do? Is there any need, do you know of any other organization that needs to, that feels like they need to dedicate themselves and 40 people working daily on, 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 on such, a, such a, a bias against them? That's a very interesting question. I'm not aware of any. Um, I haven't um, researched that question, but 
Uh, that's interesting. No, I mean, you know, my in, my intuition, my instinct would be that there probably isn't, uh, just because I don't think that there's any country in the world that's subject to such uh, obsessively critical coverage as Israel. Um, having said that, you know, it's a big world. I wouldn't be surprised if there was, but um, I also wouldn't be surprised if there isn't. I think Israel and the way it's treated by the international media is unique. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have 40 staffers, why we have so many departments, why we've been around for nearly 40 years is because this is, you know, Israel is the, you know, Jew among nations, you know, um, it, Israel is, um, you know, the Jew writ large. And just like, you know, there's no other minority arguably in the history of that has been demonized and vilified and subject to hatred as much as, as Jews. I think the same is true with Israel as the Jewish state. Yeah, well, uh, I had a feeling. I mean, I, I, I looked it up briefly. Uh, uh, I Googled it briefly. I couldn't find anything like that. But like you say, I mean, like there's uh, no special UN agency. I, I think there are a few dozen, uh, you know, dedicated to a minority or a conflict uh, like there are with Israel and the Palestinians and, and like there aren't any uh, a million types of other things. Then I would assume that you're right. Um, so what what is it that you guys... How would you dif differentiate between, let's say, a, 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 a disagreement on interpretation uh, or, or something that you say, like we argue uh, on facts? How would you, I mean, is there a fine line there? I mean, how do you, how do you work with that? Well, look, there's two things we deal with. I mean, we deal with factual errors or omissions which result in a factually inaccurate report. And those are the issues that we take directly to the editors and the journalists. But, you know, on any given day, we also might bl uh, blog on our, on our website or tweet about simply misleading coverage. Um, but, you know, our, where that line is, um, in the case of the UK, is dictated by the editor's code um, in the UK and the accuracy cause of the editor's code, which um, requires that the press take care not to mislead or distort or include factual errors. Now, that I think is pretty clear, but you know, at the same time, a story can be slanted in a way that doesn't uh, explicitly breach the editor's code, uh, their accuracy clause, but is still misleading. Um, it could just you know, be an article about some controversial incident, say that happened in Judea and Samaria, and give 90% you know, of the paragraphs devoted to the Palestinian side um, one paragraph devoted to the Israeli side, right? So there's, you know, there's nothing that's factually inaccurate per se in that um, um, disparity of coverage, but, you know, it's misleading enough that um, we would probably note it in some way, either on our blog or some other social media. So, you know, we do both. We cover both misleading and inaccurate, but we try to focus mostly on um, you know, factual inaccuracy. And we, you know, begin our job each day believing that there are such things as facts. And it's not just a matter of competing narratives. It's not just a matter of he said, she said, that there are facts that can usually be discernible. And um, it's, the, it's the journalist, the media outlet's job to um, take those concerns seriously, that their number one job is to report factually, and we hold them accountable. So I, I remember, Adam, this was uh, back, uh, I'm losing count already of the years, but uh, I would say probably six years ago, more or less, um, we had a, a, a serious wave of, uh, of terror attacks in, in Israel and particularly in Jerusalem, and there was terror, one terror attack. I was back then, I was the co-director of TPS, which is the only Israeli news agency, <clears throat> and we were covering real live events uh, uh, all over Israel. And so there was a terror attack, a terrorist uh, you know, drove a car into a, a group of people as they do sometimes. And then he, uh, when he was finally stopped, when the car was stopped, he left, he, uh, he exited the car with an ax and started attacking people on the street. And so we've seen the headlines and the headlines, including in, in the UK papers were um, a Palestinian uh, was shot dead by Israeli police in East Jerusalem. Now, th this is factually true. A Palestinian was shot dead by Israeli police in East Jerusalem. This is factually true. However, obviously, that is not the story at all. And if you say misleading, that is incredibly misleading. So, I mean, is this, is this, uh, is this something that you, how do you attack that? Because, again, it's not a factual problem so much as, as of course, they've turned the whole story up on its head, right? 
Well, no, we, we actually have had some success in pushing back against misleading headlines. In fact, if you're talking about the what was known as the stabbing intifada between 2015 and 2017, we had a whole page on camera's main site devoted to just inaccurate headlines, um, you know, either um, having the order of the events incorrect, um, omitting the fact that whatever violence happened uh, was carried out by Israeli forces um, targeting the the, the uh, Palestinian terrorists that, you know, the, the terrorist incident happened first and that um, precipitated the, you know, Israeli security forces to fire back. Um, and then there's there was just some headlines that didn't say anything to le lead the casual reader perusing the headline to realize that what had happened was a terror attack, that you'd be forgiven if you were just perusing the headlines in the mainstream media to believe that Palestine, uh, Israeli uh, security personnel, just for no particular reason, um, committed violence against Palestinians. So no, we actually did fight back um, per the accuracy clause of the you know Brit of UK editors code, and also in the uh, US and, and got some traction because um, most you know the editors code also mentioned specifically about not just in the body of the text but in in the headline. Now it's hard when the headline is just unfair, but sometimes it crosses from it crossed the line from unfair to inaccurate. And um, we were able to get some success in getting the uh, media outlets to take our concerns seriously. And um, some of them were improved, some of them were corrected outright. And I think that there was actually at the time in 2017, I think it was, there was a Knesset hearing, I think chaired by Tsipi Livy at the time. Um, and it, it um, where they invited journalists, I think the, the, the regional director from Reuters and some other media outlets to discuss just how um, problematic from the most, you know, basic understanding of what journalism is, these these headlines were. And I think there was even an acknowledgement by some media outlets that there was an issue, and I think there was some improvement. So no, we take headlines very seriously, especially since a lot of people don't read the article, they right. just read the headlines. So, uh, so what's what's the the comments that you're getting? I mean, if, if, if you, let's say, point out something like this or some other things that are outrageous, and uh, are they are they open to listen? Do they care that they are promoting some kind of a, an agenda? Do they see it as, as an agenda that they're promoting? Do they see you know the the hidden motive behind it? Is it hidden at all? What kind of uh, what, what kind of reactions are you getting for, for your work? You mean reactions from the media outlets themselves? Yes, yes. It's usually like they don't like us, um, but I think they respect us. Um, so. And one of the things that we try really hard to do is to build relationships with these media outlets, even when, you know, during the battle, during the intifada, um, we're coming from Israel, and we're obviously reacting in a very emotional way to these attacks. And we're, you know, quite frankly, quite angry at this distortion of reality. We always communicate to journalists and editors um, in a very professional and just um, you know, matter, just um, very professional like um, tone. We don't use hyperbole. We don't accuse them of anything. We just simply state, this is what you claim. Here are the facts. Can you please correct based on the facts? So I would say with some media outlets, they've grown to respect us and take us seriously. Other outlets, it depends on the outlet, some not so much. Mm -hmm. um, but um, we're very careful to be professional. Even on Twitter, where, you, as you know, Twitter is a, a forum where it brings out the worst of people and there's just anger and you know and hyperbole and vitriol um, back and forth. We almost always remain civil and we try to just appeal to their sense of professionalism. And look how they feel about us um, in their in their in their own mind. I'll never know for sure. But I think with a lot of media outlets, there is a respect. And at the very least, with other outlets, they realize they can ignore us because we have a big platform because we are willing to take the complaints to the next level. In the case of the UK, there is a, a body called IPSO, Independent Press Standards Organization, which adjudicates complaints um, if you can't uh, re resolve it with the media outlet. So, um, you know, we're respected and if not liked, you know, we're taken seriously. Well, that's uh, very good. I assume that that took you a long time. The organization, it took it a long time to, to, to get to where you are, where you say a lot of them respect us because, well, I, you, I would like to think, right, at least, I mean, people don't, people usually say the government, the media, it's not one thing, it's not one person, it's a, it, there's a lot of individual human beings, uh, which like any other collective, uh, uh, you know, 
you have different people that have different intentions and different knowledge, different backgrounds. Uh, but I would like to think that at least some, or if not most, of journalists want to get it right, even if you know there's some kind of a, a, a cognitive dissonance or or whatever it is. Then you know at least they have their hearts in the right place. So if you come as a watchdog and and point things out to them, hopefully they can. Uh, come to a place where they respect you, and and it's it, it's I think it's incredible to hear that this is where your organization is at right now. Yeah, no, look, you know, like you said, I think that most journalists really wake up in the morning trying to do a good job, taking their job seriously. A lot of them have been working professionally in the media for years, if not you know tens of years. Um, but at the same time, the one problem is that you know, and we've written about this a lot is. A lot of journalists mistake their job as as an extension of their political activism. Right. Um, you know, a great case in point, and and it, God, it's not only this journalist, but you know, Robert Fisk, the Independence Middle East correspondent who passed away recently, um, was very open that he saw his job as um, advocating on behalf of the oppressed, quote unquote, and pushing back at the oppressor, and that journalists should never be neutral. Well, you know, to some degree, you can read that. Um, in different ways, but you know, I, I, if you looked at Robert Fisk's coverage, it was clear he saw Israel as the oppressor. So even in his mind, if he was trying to do a good job and took his job seriously, you know, every article he wrote was colored by you know the Israeli Goliath versus the Palestinian David. And if you see your job as an advocate, as an activist, not a journalist, you know, your coverage is, is going to reflect that. And I think that's. One of the biggest problems that we find, not just Fisk, but throughout the British media, and, I, and I'm sure my colleagues would argue throughout the rest of the uh, mainstream media, yeah. is the sense that they're on the side of the Palestinians, and you know they really try hard to show the Palestinian perspective insofar as they're the ones that are suffering, and and it really skews their coverage, and it really um, does a disservice to news consumers out there, millions of news consumers. I think so too. I mean, if, if uh, I mean. You know what you and I are doing is is being activists, right? We have uh, we have our ideology and, and we're advancing it, but we're not trying to do that under a cloth of uh, reporting objectively the the facts and the truth. We're saying, I mean, we we back what we're say, what we say with facts and 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 you know and a reasoned argument. Uh, but I think you know, the, and, and what is concerning now is that you know, uh, in, in a sense, journalists like most people have decided that they belong to one camp, one political camp or another. And every every topic that comes under the kind of the umbrella of that political camp is something that they advocate. So, if, you know, so uh, so we see ourselves, unfortunately, as an underdog in the media because we don't actually, this is, you know, Israel is not as popular as, as some other causes that, that kind of bring a lot of these journalists together nowadays. And so, so what do you do? I mean, if there's like a media outlet that is, let's say, leaning more to be, you know, pro-Israel. Do you, do you have any relationship with those or, or that's not outside your mandate? Yeah, like a good example to answer your question is um, in the UK, the, the Times of London and the Telegraph um, and to some degree the Daily Mail are much better when it comes to Israel. Um, their editorial line is much more favorable of Israel. And so, you know, within my community, within my say social media oriented posts about their articles, if they're problematic, my tone will be different, but at the same time, they still abide by the same professional standards as other media outlets, and they sometimes get it wrong. Um, another interesting thing is that, you know, oftentimes in my experience with the Times and the Telegraph, their official editorials were pro-Israel oftentimes, but their local Jerusalem correspondents were often, um, you know, within the herd of independent thinkers, as we like to joke, who were anti-Israel. They traveled in anti-Israel circles and they covered the, the story just like their peers in other media outlets. So, um, you know, even, you know, I, I think the Telegraph and the Times both are really, you know, I respect them as publications and they give Israel a fair hearing most of the time, but there's often problems and we uh, um, communicate them, we communicate to them just as we would to the Guardian or the Independent or Channel 4 um, or the BBC. That is, we hold them accountable when we come up with and we don't play favorites in the sense that, you know, our standard is the truth and um, I'm not going to go after them in the way that I would go after the Guardian because the Guardian is unique in its brand of, I would say, their malign obsession with the Jewish state, but we're still going to hold the Times and the Telegraph accountable. So let me ask you now, I want to hear some examples because I think this is very important, very interesting. And, you know, the recent 
success, let's say, which was a like a, a joint effort by many many groups in the UK to get uh, you know a, a, a uh, Jeremy Corbyn out of the Labour Party, which didn't really work out you know uh, in the perfect way, let's say. Uh, but you know the the. Human Rights Commission's report on the on anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, and I think you know I say it was a joint effort because obviously there was a legal effort, and we uh, 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 and we've discussed that on one hand, and but also I think a major part of it was public opinion to get to the point where the Human Rights Commission was even able, right? They feed off the public, get everyone else, and I think uh, you know kind of monitoring the media and giving examples and doing this is, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you've probably been doing this for years collecting all these type of anti-Semitic statement by Corbyn and others as well. Um, exactly. So how do you feel about that? I'm sure that was a major day for you guys. I mean, uh, I mean, you, um, you, you have a, a definite share in that success. So how did, how did that work out? What did you guys do over the years and how, how did you feel about success? Look, we, as a UK brand, you know, Cameron, you, we've been around since 2009 and we have a couple um, London based uh, bloggers slash correspondents who's been, who've been covering, who's covering Jeremy Corbyn when he was a backbencher, um, you know, uh, who nobody, almost nobody knew about. And so we didn't just have blog posts about what he said, but we had videos. Um, a friend of ours named Richard Millet, who you may be familiar with, he's a very well-known uh, blogger in the UK. And he, we were publishing posts and videos of Corbyn's uh, associations with terror, with terror supporters, associations with Holocaust deniers. Um, we had um, so when he, when when Corbyn became uh, Labour Party leader in 2015, we had six years of documentation uh, that this guy was an extremist. This guy was an ideological extremist, and if not an anti-Semite, certainly someone who tolerated anti-Semitism. And so, you know, around the time that he became Labour leader, we were, I think, one of the first organizations. Um, putting that out there, putting out those videos, um, complaining about how media outlets were obfuscating um, the, you know, the head of the Labour Party's long history of engaging with and, um, and endorsing anti-Semitic and, and, and pro-terrorist um, leaders, including Hamas, including Hezbollah, including some real fringe Holocaust deniers. Um, so, you know, whereas, like I told you before, most of what we do is to go after factual errors. In this case, we decided since our, you know, we have a dual mission, factual accuracy about Israel, but also combating anti-Semitism as, as part of our core issue. We fought back early on, even, you know, I think even before it became common to hear uh, Jeremy Corbyn being characterized as an anti-Semite uh, or a terror supporter, we were disseminating information on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our blog. I'm saying, hey, where's the media? Like, why are they simply describing him as a lefty? He's not just a lefty, you know, he's not just someone who is socialist and, um, you know, wishes to nationalize the railway. He's someone that um, has, you know, has been taking tea with people that really hate Jews and people that have killed Jews. Um, so I think we were effective in just getting that out there and um, and getting those videos out there that I think in years, years later, by 2017, 2018, uh, major media outlets like the Daily Mail and uh, the Times were circulating, um, you know, that were just, you know, just at that point, of course, it became, it was, it was the, you know, there was an like avalanche of information about Corbyn, but um, so, yeah, we, I think, played an instrumental role in collecting information and disseminating that information when it was needed. And I think a lot of that helped the, the British Jewish community kind of like feel like, yeah, it's not just their instinct that this guy has a problem with Jews. It's his record uh, going back years and years in the parliament when he was a backbencher. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious, uh, um, let's say over that long period of time, so obviously, like you said, I mean, some, some media outlets are more open to, to reporting on this and, 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 and even blaming the head of the Labour Party of, of being anti-Semitic. But was there ever a time where it was mainstream media all across the board, even now after the Human Rights Commission's report uh, came out? Was there ever a time where you saw that uh, finally it was all across the board that they've condemned uh, uh, Corbyn's anti-Semitic or not? Well, not across the board, but there was an interesting point maybe in 2018 or 2019, or maybe 2018, where media, where, where in, the, in the UK media environment, where there, there's a much lower threshold of being sued for libel and defamation. 
and media outlets are usually very careful to accuse anyone of racism without qualifying the language as saying, you know, some say he's racist. There are some major media outlets like the Times that were referring to him as someone who's anti-Semitic. I mean, there was at some point where, you know, there is this um, turning point, this tipping point, where it became just uncontroversial to refer to Jeremy Corbyn as someone who's anti-Semitic. And you know, there is some, um, for instance, the Jewish, um, the, the Jewish Chronicle in the UK, you know, Stephen Pollard, I think people like him at first would qualify their editorials by saying, though no one is accusing him necessarily of being personally anti-Semitic, he's had a long history of associating with anti-Semites. Mm -hmm. And at some point they stopped qualifying it. And I think that was a real turning point. Um, you know, the poll in 2018 showing that 85 some uh, percent of British Jews thought that he was personally anti-Semitic. You know, at some point it became uh, conventional wisdom. And look, you know, um, they never, uh, the Corbyn camp never sued um, uh, journalists or other figures for um, making those claims. So at some point it, it just became almost like, I wouldn't say conventional wisdom, but certainly um, not anything that people were outraged when they heard it. It seemed like it made sense. It, on some intuitive level, they understood why people would see that he's not just condones anti-Semitism, but has personally anti-Semitic himself. Yeah. Well, you know, as a lawyer, I'm always uh, kind of, uh, you know, I get a little bit excited whenever people say lawsuits and stuff like that. And so, uh, <laughs> you know, it's part of what we do is, is that we expose a lot of organizations as terror proxies and and, uh, right. and funneling money to terrorist organizations. And people always say to me, you, you're not afraid of being sued for defamation. Well, I, this is my, like my, would be my dream coming true. They sue me <laughs> for defamation for that. So I think, you know, if Jeremy Corbyn had, filed a defamation lawsuit against one of these publications, that would have been uh, a very happy day for at least some of us lawyers. <laughs> right. Right. Sure. Because it gives you the opportunity to then now prove in a court of law that he's actually anti-Semitic, which I don't see how he would, uh, he would uh, you know, win this, such a case. And well, it's, it's like when David Irving sued uh, Deborah Lipstadt, right? I mean, it, it pretty much, you know, at the end of the day, it, it just not just um, vindicated Deborah Lipstadt, but it just vindicated those that were saying that this guy was a Holocaust denier and anti-Semite. Like, you know, he got the opposite of what he wanted. Exactly, exactly. So sometimes it can work in your favor. I mean, at least if you're that confident of, of, of the case that you have, and I think that we are. And so tell me about some, some, some other cases. I mean, I'm sure that, uh, you know, even small things, again, I come from, you know, from international law. So some things like make me super angry, like when people use a term like illegal occupation, that people don't know that that's not even a term that doesn't belong in international law. There is no such thing as illegal occupation. But I'm sure that, you know, you can't go to that kind of resolution. But there are things that are even, you know, greater and, and more infuriating. So give me an example or two. One of the most infuriating charges that uh, we fought back against over the years that thankfully we're fighting back, having to fight back less and less because I think we've successfully corrected them is the claim that there are Jews only roads in the West Bank um, in Judea and Samaria. Now, there never have been Jews only roads. You know, as you know, there's a small, maybe according to even Bethsalem, there's a small percentage of roads in Judea and Samaria that are restricted to Palestinian traffic. But even that small percentage of roads that are restricted to Palestinian traffic, you know, Jews, Muslims, Christians, foreigners, um, is, Israel, you know, from Israel um, are allowed to ride on those roads. So there's never been a religious test for riding on any roads in, in the West Bank. And that's extremely important smear, extremely important libel, because it gives rise and gives credence to the bigger uh, Israel apartheid smear. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we've, um, from the er early 2000s um, to, I'd say, 2010, 2012, we fought back and, you know, there is simply no way for a media outlet to um, defend that charge that there are Jews only roads in the West Bank or even settler only Jews roads in the West Bank. You know, there's no roads that are only for settlers. Yeah. Um, so we occasionally see that, but now, you know, but rarely, I'd say much less than we used to. And when we do see it, we're almost always able to get it corrected. So that's just an example of, you know, motivated by pure narrative, pure ideological agenda to tar Israel as an apartheid state, uh, despite the fact that there's no, uh, no justification whatsoever for that claim. As far as can Israel's I, can, illegal can, I, can I tell a little anecdote about those roads, which I found I, I always laugh about, is that whenever I take 
you know, I've, I've been around Judean Samaria with journalists or diplomats or, or, or advisors. And so whenever you kind of enter into the into area C, all of a sudden everything changes because, uh, you know, you see Palestinians' uh, cars and Palestinians' license plates on the road, which is, uh, you know, all, you know people notice that after a minute or two or five, doesn't matter. And then people freak out. They freak out. But why, why do they freak out? They say, is this safe for us? Would someone target us? Would, would, you know, would, would, would we be stoned or attacked in any other way? So that's what they're concerned about. But, you know, they obviously they see for their own eyes that we travel together on the same roads. But that's just an anecdote that I find amusing. Sorry about that. Right, right. <laughs> no, and also just anybody who lives in Israel, of course, has a much better sense of, you know, of, what, of, of what's true. You know, you know intuitively, uh, you know, if you've ever driven up to those signs that say Israeli is not, you know, this is area A, Israeli is not permitted, then, you know, you know, it, it's the opposite is true that there's a lot, there's a large number of roads that Israelis aren't going to drive on just by army regulation because it's not safe. So, um, and also, of course, Hebron, you know, the, the idea that, what, what is it, five to 10% of Hebron is, um, you know, is restricted to, to Palestinians, but 90% of Hebron is restricted to Jews, you know. Um, so I think the biggest, the things that boil my blood, the things that we push back with even more intensity are those, you know, quote unquote, little lies that give rise to the Israeli apartheid smear, um, which I think is one of the most important things that we do, because um, within the cognitive war against Israel, that's one of the biggest, um, uh, you know, items in their toolkit. Uh, definitely, definitely. Um, there was something that you said earlier, and I, I am just, I'm very interested in, 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 in understanding it a little bit, because you said that camera also deals with Arab speaking media. Um, so I'm sure that's very, very different. And uh, I don't know, you tell me, maybe they're not even trying to say that they don't have an agenda, but how does that work? Well, we only deal with, first of all, we've only had the um, Arabic media department for, I think, two years. We focus only on Arabic media outlets which adhere to Western standards of journalism. Mm -hmm. So we don't deal with out with the Qatar based Al Jazeera. Yeah. We deal with BBC Arabic, with independent Arabic, with uh, Sky News Arabia, uh, with France Arabic. Um, you know, Arabic arms of um, old and, and respected media organizations that abide by standards. So having said that, yeah, we've had a little bit of success um, a lot lately. I mean, you know, little things like, for instance, we were able to get, and maybe it's not so little, actually, we were able to get uh, independent Arabia to stop referring to um, Gaza envelope communities, um, with our which are obviously within 1967 Israel, as settlements. So, you know, these are things that, that you know, their Arabic uh, viewing audience or readers um, probably didn't think twice about, but insofar as these media outlets uh, claim to abide by Western standards, you know, you just can't get away with claiming that, you know, Sterot is a settlement. So uh, at a certain point, they stopped doing that. They, they've also been much better after our communication of referring to Tel Aviv as the capital or using Tel Aviv as a metonym or a synonym for the capital. Yeah. So we are Breaking They're not through. calling Tel Aviv a settlement because if you look at the Palestinian media, yeah. then they call Tel Aviv a settlement. Uh, <laughs> so it's like we're not there. Right, right. Well, they, yeah. they, right. These media outlets don't refer to Tel Aviv as a settlement, but they, you know, they've completely, for, you know, want to refer to it as as the capital because uh, to recognize Jerusalem would be, you know, a big problem. Yeah. But um, look, we're making some progress on that. I, I think it's important because these, you know, BBC Arabic, you know, it has the improv, it has the logo of BBC. Right, so it's not just Arabic; it's BBC Arabic, right. and um, so that that's like a new and very interesting part of what we do. Now that we have an Arabic department, for instance, you know we can go to our Arabic researchers and get a translation uh, to see if even like a, a photo within the Palestinian territory that has Arabic, whether the caption in the photo is being is accurate. Um, it just gives us a lot more um, research ca capacity to fight back against media bias, but. And I think, you know, in the long term, I think it looks good in terms of these uh, Arabic uh, Western media outlets and keeping them accountable. No, for sure. hundred percent. It's, it's very, very important. And uh, so let me ask you, can you say what is now at the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, what is what, what do you think is the biggest challenge or one of the most uh, significant challenges that you guys are now facing when when you kind of scan the media and and. and 
but this is a little maybe unconventional response, but you know, I, I spent a lot of time uh, reading about um, you know these new um, intellectual theories that are, I would say, influencing the media landscape, uh, critical race theory, intersectionality, social, this, um, social media, uh, or rather uh, the social justice movement, um, post-colonialism. Um, there definitely is a growing acceptance within, in the, within the public sphere of these once marginal fringe ideologies um, that are now um, taking root and are becoming much more mainstream. And the danger of these ideologies is that um, it, it, in its obsessive framing of um, complex political phenomenon as white and black, you know, um, as you know, um, Jews are, are kind of like they don't know what to do with Jews, so Jews get lumped as white, um, you know. So we that's see on the this context. Moment. I mean, we're white when it's convenient, and we're not white. Well, it's not convenient. yeah, that's true. You're right. Um, <laughs> you know, right wing extremists view us as um, you know not white, and the left wing extremists view us as white. But um, you know, you know, within this very fast and I think very dangerous, um, you know, division of oppressor and oppressed as you know black versus white um jews are just are, are put in the white category regardless of the fact that you know a plurality of israeli jews are from Mizrahi backgrounds it's almost like white and black has taken on more of a metaphorical or, or symbolic importance mm -hmm. and i think this is more important than it seems because you know within the social justice mo um, movement and within modern woke um you know, Twitter and within uh, modern progressive activists, they see themselves as on the side of the historically oppressed. And despite the fact that by any standard, Jews have been among the most historically oppressed people in history, we're being lumped in as white people. And I think that, you know, and I think some of that even gets internalized within the Jewish community, where, you know, they almost feel that, um, you know, that even though they know on some level that they're part of this marginal religious community, they still feel like they're white and that, you know, that they're, and, and that their privilege, quote unquote, is being used against them. Um, you know, and I've often told people also that within this, these uh, radical ideologies, the idea of privilege, right? The idea that um, within society, uh, those who aren't doing well economically or socially are not doing well because they're victimized by a white supremacist system. Well, if you're to buy that, then you also have to accept that those that are doing well, i.e. Jews, are benefiting from a white supremacist or white racist system, right? So within these um, seemingly marginal and um, easily mockable ideologies, sows the seeds of attacks on Jews. Because if you attack success, if you attack the idea of merit, and a merit-based system, then you're necessarily attacking Jews because um, though not all Jews are rich, Jews in general in the diaspora in Israel are doing well. And I think that's being used um, as, as a bludgeon to attack Jews and to make Jews be on the defensive that, you know, even our success is evidence that, you know, we're complicit in this white supremacist system. And I'm concerned because what used to be in the universities are now becoming uh, commonplace within media outlets. And I think the Jewish community, I think the pro-Israel community is going to have to learn to engage in the battle of ideas, not just the battle of facts, but the, because the, the war of ideas, um, I think ultimately has a much, um, is much more dangerous. Um, this, they give rise, it, it gives rise to um, a Jewish community that feels it's constantly going to have to be um, on the defensive. I think it also, uh, I mean, we see that uh, um, the same logic is kind of pointing, you know, the finger at, at the state of Israel, because the state of Israel is, is a successful state. I mean, obviously, it's not perfect state. I mean, there's a lot for us to do, God knows. Um, but we are relatively a, a very successful state, especially in the region. We are a very successful state in the region, uh, uh, almost by any category. And so it's, I, I, and, and despite the fact that this was against all odds and all the, fought, the wars that were launched against us and the terrorist attacks and, 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 and dozens of countries that kind of aligned up against us and we succeeded against all odds, uh, people still, you know, they view that success as, you know, th there must be something wrong, 
you know, with this country if, if this country was a success. That's more or less, uh, I think, the logic. And here you have right. a, a group of people like the Palestinians that have failed to build a state or to build a sustainable society or to build any kind of a, a progress as a collective. And so it must be, you know, the successful entity's fault. And that's it. That's the end of the discussion. So I think the the ludicrous, you know, the even, you know, the greatest, uh, um, you know, I think, uh, um, uh, um, it's just a, an amazing contradiction and hypocrisy is when you look at and minority groups like Christians or or the uh, LGBTQ uh, community and, and, and women's rights, you know, you name it. Then, of course, by looking at, you know, Israel and then, you know, neighboring countries, then if you really support those rights, then you need to be on on, on the side of, of the country that does support and advances these rights and, uh, as opposed to those who oppress them. Uh, but we can get to, you know, we can get that logic across. So, so w w what do you think we should? Ha wh what do you think is 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 the way to kind of fight against that? Well, look, I mean, I think the first thing you need to do is familiarize yourself with the ideas um, and understand, you know, where these pro pro Palestinian anti Israel activists are coming from. Um, so that, look, when we contextualize co media coverage of Israel. One of the elements that we see so often, this is related to what I said earlier, and that is the failure of media uh, of journalists to assign moral agency to Palestinians so that they're always treated as they're being acted upon. They're never considered to be moral actors. They're infantilized. Um, and I think that goes hand in hand with the kind of critical race theory, intersectionality, these uh, radical um, ideological ideas that you know not only separate people between oppressed and oppressed but don't assign agency to palestinians so for one thing i think that people that believe in classical liberal ideas who would believe that you know individuals should be treated equally and believe in universal human rights should demand that you know palestinian terrorists be tr be held accountable the same way that a quote unquote radical jewish settler would be held that there isn't, you know, in the real world, you know, people make decisions, right? And if you would read media coverage of Israel, if you just, you know, want, again, one of these glaring trends, the glaring pattern is that Palestinians are never seen as actors. They're never, they're never, you know, their ideology, their actions, uh, their decisions, which um, injuriously Im impact their outcomes are never taken seriously. So I would just, you know, ask people to take that idea seriously and that you know you you can't understand anti-israel media bias without understanding that first and foremost it's a matter of the media not taking palestinians seriously as as agents of their own fate and assigning all the responsibility for the not just the conflict but all the moral responsibility and all the responsibility for um for for um, solving the conflict to the israeli side and i think you know so i think people have to demand um, that you know, Palestinians and, and Israelis be treated equally in every sense of the word, morally yeah. and politically. It's not just a responsibility for the conflict. I, you know, if, I, I've seen reports over the years. For example, the World Health Organization issued a report that apparently, you know, violence against women and children within the Palestinian family is also Israel's fault. And, uh, and, you know, different uh, problems with, you know, the Christian population decreasing uh, tremendously over the, you know, the, the, the recent decades, also Israel's fault within the Palestinian control. Everything is Israel's fault. And, and even domestic, you know, the, uh, 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 you know, issues uh, isn't anyone else's fault, but Israel's fault. Right. In fact, you know, we've written some posts about uh, articles in the in the Guardian and elsewhere, where they, you know, where they implicitly or even explicitly blame the reported rise of suicide within Gaza as a result of Israeli actions. You know, so not only, and again, they're not basing this causation on any particular evidence or any empirical data. It just they're so colored by this um, belief in, you know. Israeli power to impact the lives of Palestinians that they're willing to ignore, for instance, what Hamas does, you know, how awful it must be for Palestinians to live under a theocratic totalitarian uh, Islamist um, regime in Hamas. Impressive regime, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, like you said, like even social issues like spousal abuse, um, like I said, um, suicide, 
you know, there's really no major Palestinian problem that hasn't been contextualized by media outlets in a way that uh, implicitly or explicitly assigns responsibility to Israel. And I think that's just unforgivable in terms of its, you know, failure to treat Palestinians like like adults that that wake up every morning and like we all do and make decisions. Yeah, one hundred percent. Well, Adam, I think it's amazing the work that you do, and it's certainly a major challenge, and it's super important. And uh, you know, like th these few issues that we've discussed, like you know, uh, the recent example, like how do you how do you educate, or how do you make a media outlet correct something that is a complete, pure interpretation based on you know the premise of their ideological beliefs, you know, like suicide within the Gaza Strip. So this is an incredibly difficult job that you have, you know, trying to kind of convince them that there's a broader context and a, and a bigger explanation. And uh, they need to kind of zoom out even a little bit uh, uh, to see the bigger picture. Um, so I would like to thank you, you and the entire organization for every the work that you have been doing over so many years. Thanks very much. And same back to you. The Your organization does such important work. And, um, you know, we're aware, we've been aware of your organization for a while. And you're, you really take the fight to them. So thanks for what you do. All right, wonderful. Well, it was great having you here, Adam. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I wish you and everyone uh, a better, healthier 2021. <laughs> Thanks. And, I uh, appreciate it. All right, good seeing you. Good talking to you. Thanks so much. Thanks.